So in this video, I'm going to give a recap of shear, including shear stress, shear strain, and the shear modulus. So to start off with, um, probably the main equation that we're going to use in this topic is that tau is equal to V divided by A. So tau is our average shear stress, and it's going to have stress units, so probably going to want to work with it in MPA most of the time. V is your shear force, and it's a force, so it's measured in newtons. And A is your cross-sectional area for your member. And you're probably going to want to work with that in millimeters squared. Now, just remember that if you're working in MPA, millimeters squared, and newtons, all of these units kind of work together so that if, for example, you have your um, units in newtons and millimeters squared, you'd end up with MPA for stress without needing to do any further conversions. So, let's talk a little bit about how we can get the shear force in a member. So, let's pretend we have a member that looks like this. And we're going to have a few different forces that are going to try and shear it. Okay. So I guess to be able to recognize shear forces as opposed to axial forces, these ones are going to try and bend your member out of shape. And in this case, it's going to try and make it more V-shaped um, than before. This can be contrasted against axial forces. So for example, if I had this thing being pulled on either end, let's call them I don't know, F4 and F5, these forces here represent axial forces and they're only gonna try and extend the member. If we flip them around and put them in compression, they just try and um, make it smaller in the length. They wouldn't actually change the shape. So, if we want to find the internal shear force within a member, um, that's completely possible. We need to pick um, a point of interest that we want to find it at. So let's pretend we're interested in this point here. What we do is perform a cut through our material, just like you would do with truss analysis using the method of sections approach. And we need to redraw the free body diagram of either the left or the right hand side. It doesn't matter which one, you're going to get the same answer. So usually you pick the one that has the fewest forces on it. So in this case, I'm going to pick the left side because it's only got a couple of things happening. So redrawing the free body diagram you can take across the external forces. And what I need to do is replace at the cut with my um, internal loads. So I'm going to have a normal force, which I'm going to call N. And this is the one that we looked at when we did method of sections. And we're also going to have a shear force, which I'm going to draw downwards. And remember, we call it V. So in order to maintain equilibrium, we need to satisfy our equilibrium equations. So summing forces in the X direction, we're going to find that the internal axial load has to be equal to F4. And summing in the y direction, we're going to find that the internal shear load has to be equal to F1. And this would be V, if you had a number for it, what you could go back and put into your equation to calculate shear stress. You just need to know the cross-sectional area um, to be able to find it. So the next thing I want to talk about is shear stress versus shear strain diagrams. So just like when we did normal stress versus normal strain, stress goes on the y-axis and we're using tau, and strain goes on the x-axis. And this time, because we're looking at shear strain, not the longitudinal strain, this one is going to be um, gamma. And we can measure this one in radians. So what we find is if we plot the shear stress versus the shear strain, we end up with a curve that looks quite similar um, to what we would have got if we did normal stress versus normal strain. So we end up with like a linear region, and then we have a plastic region where it's non-linear anymore. So we still have a yield point, which marks the transition from the linear part of the graph to the non-linear part. And we still have a fracture point where our sample that we would be testing breaks at the end. So through this linear part of our graph, we can calculate the gradient of it. 
So on the y-axis would be the change in the stress. On the x-axis is the change in the strain. And we're going to call the gradient G. So if we want to write this mathematically, G is equal to the change in stress divided by the change in strain through this uh, linear or elastic region. So the other name for or what G actually is called is the shear modulus. Alternatively, some people call it the modulus of rigidity as well. And this is just like Young's modulus is sometimes called the modulus of elasticity. It's just got a few different names. And it's going to have the stress units as well. So you're probably going to want to measure this in um, megapascals, for example. So this is a material property, G that is. So each different material, like aluminium, copper, um, steel, whatever, each of them has their own um, shear modulus. So the last equation that we need to cover is the one that relates together some material properties. And it looks like this. So on the left, G is your shear modulus. On the top line here, E is Young's modulus. And underneath, in the bracket, we end up with Poisson's ratio. So you can use this equation to convert between each of the material properties. Um, and yeah, it's going to be each of these properties, so shear modulus, Young's modulus, and Poisson's ratio, is unique to the material that you're looking at. So I think that's all the equations that we need to cover for this year topic. And there'll be a few example videos that you can have a look at, which look at the applications of them.